Hey everybody, my name is Ryan Hughley and uh, I'm a church planter and pastor of church here in Salt Lake City, Utah called Formation and it's an honor to be able to open God's word with you for just a couple of minutes today. Uh, I want to say thank you to Manushka who's become such a, an encouraging online friend. Uh, any opportunity to sit with Jesus in the scriptures with other people, I really count an honor. And so thanks so much for letting me do this. Um, before we jump into God's word, why don't we just take a minute and uh, ask the Spirit of God to open our hearts to receive what it is that he wants to say to us. So if you are comfortable and not driving, I want to invite you to just close your eyes uh, wherever you are right now and to just do your best to really settle your heart and become present in this moment. Jesus is here with us right now. He's here with me where I am. He is there with you where you are. And so take just a couple of deep breaths, if you would. Long, deep inhale through your, through your nose and then a long, slow exhale through your mouth. And just remember as you, as you feel that breath, that every breath is grace from God. So just a couple of deep breaths that helps regulate our nervous system and bring us to a state of calm so we can really be present to what it is that the Spirit of God wants to say to us today. Father, we thank you that you are a good father. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you invite us into deep, meaningful, genuine, intimate relationship with you. And Lord, we just confess that sometimes we settle for relating with you at a distance. But Lord, I hear your invitation to draw near, even right now. And so I pray that your spirit would draw us near as we consider what it would look like to go deeper with you in this new year together. So would you open our eyes to see? Would you open our ears to hear? And would you open our hearts to receive what you would say to us? We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I've never really been... Uh, one of those people who have like declared a word for the year. I know a lot of a lot of people do that and have found value in that. I've just never really done that. It's never been a practice for me for some reason. But then early December of last year, I did really start to to ask the Holy Spirit what was on his heart for me in this new year, what was on his heart for our church formation here in Salt Lake this year. And, uh, and over and over again throughout the month of December, he kept bringing me back to this same word, and it was the word devotion. And as I've talked a little bit about this online, Manushka said uh, much of it seemed to resonate with where you are as a church uh, this year as well. And so I wanted to talk just for a few minutes about devotion. Now, we probably all know this, but the English word devotion is defined as the fact or state of being passionately dedicated and loyal to something or someone. But in addition to being an English word, you know, it's also a prominent word throughout the Bible. And so what I want to do with our time is I'm really, I just want to look at one verse, if that's okay. And it's in Acts chapter 2, and it's verse 42. And so just before uh, we jump into this, let me just tell you a couple things that I think are really important. The first is to understand that Acts 2.42 is a descriptive text. Now, you might be familiar with that, um, or you may not. But if you're not, just understand that in Scripture, there are essentially two types of text. There are descriptive and prescriptive. Now, a descriptive text, like the one we're going to read in Acts chapter 2, it, as it says, it describes something that did happen. A prescriptive text prescribes what should happen. So in Acts 2.42, we're reading a story about what took place. That's descriptive. In Philippians 4, when Paul says, do not be anxious about anything, that is prescriptive. He's prescribing something for us. Does that make sense? So this is a descriptive descriptive text. Now, that being said, just because it's descriptive of something that happened then doesn't mean that it holds no value for us today. And so the question that we bring to descriptive text is always, how could this benefit me today? Now, the second thing I want you to understand is that these events that we're about to read in Acts 2.42, because they basically summarize the practice of the early church, they all take place after Peter's Pentecost sermon. So, 
most likely, uh, if you're watching this, you have some sense of New Testament history. But remember, Jesus, God the Son, is born to the Virgin Mary, spends about 30 years in obscurity, then three years uh, as an itinerant teacher, uh, healing the sick, delivering the spiritually oppressed. He is crucified. He rises again. He gathers his disciples together. He appears to over 500 people uh, in this short time period. And then he commissions his disciples to go make disciples. And he tells them that the Holy Spirit's going to come, and so they're supposed to wait for the Spirit to come. And so they gather together, and they pray, and they beg God for the Spirit to send the Spirit. The Spirit does come, and then these once cowardly misfits leave this place, and they go out preaching with great boldness, telling everyone that will listen the good news of Jesus. And so Peter, in Acts chapter 2, stands up, preaches this big message, and uh, one of the least seeker-sensitive messages that's ever been preached, basically accusing this group of people of killing the Messiah, but their hearts are pricked, the scriptures say. The Spirit brings them to conviction, and it says that 3,000 people, just because of that message, in one day give their hearts to Jesus, which is incredible. But then there's this kind of really important question, like how do 3,000 new believers begin to order their lives around Jesus together. And Acts 2.42 is the answer to that question. So this might be a familiar verse to you, but I want you to just try to listen with fresh ears, if you would. Because Luke writes this. He says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And so where I really want you to focus your attention right now is on those first three words. They devoted themselves. Now that three word phrase actually translates one Greek word that means to persevere devotedly or to persist obstinately. Now this might sound like grammar nerd stuff, but this is also a present active verb. And that's important for more than just grammar nerds. It's important because it, it tells us that this, uh, this type of verb is used to portray an action in process or a state of being with no assessment of the action's completion. Now what that means is it implies ongoing action as opposed to a one-time event. So in, if I were to say, as a pastor, I study and teach the Bible, uh, that's not a one-time thing that I do. That's what the majority of my life and vocation are committed to. And so I, that's an ongoing, so that would be an example of a present active verb. So this implies ongoing action. These things became a way of life for them. The apostles' teaching, the breaking of bread, the fellowship, and prayer. Those four things became these practices that their lives were ordered around. And the text is very, very clear that they devoted themselves to these things. Now, here's why I think that that is so important and why that one phrase warrants so much attention. Their devotion is what positioned them for everything they experienced. So as you know, if you keep reading the book of Acts, you're going to read just in these incredible, miraculous feats of God through these people. They experienced uh, the presence and the power of God in a way that is frankly difficult for us to even conceive of. And their devotion to following Jesus, to these four things that we see, is what positioned them to experience all of that. And so that has had me really sitting with this very simple mantra this year. And this is the one that I gave to our church as well. And it's this, just that discipleship demands devotion. Discipleship demands devotion. You see, the notion that grace provides salvation for us, but it demands nothing from us, is just quite frankly a lie. It's not, it's not true. Now, we don't devote ourselves in order to earn anything or to prove anything to God. Our salvation is a free gift. Hopefully you know that it is a free gift. When Jesus hung on the cross and breathed his last breath and said, it is finished. There was nothing left to earn. There was nothing left to prove. All of that is given to us by grace. And that gift comes with the invitation to follow Jesus, not just to get our Willy Wonka golden ticket and go off and, and when we die and be in heaven, but to follow Jesus, to be disciples. And so this is, this is so much of what I've been sitting with and what we've been thinking about over the course of this year. And, and at the heart of this is this deep longing inside of me. 
and a growing longing inside of our church. And my assumption is it's a longing inside of you. And it's the longing to actually experience the abundant life, the, the new life, the inside out transformation that Jesus promises us. You know that, right? Like Jesus does promise to do more than just save us. He promises our transformation. The scriptures say that, that the Spirit of God is always working, forming us more and more into the image of Christ. That is what is held out to us in this invitation from Jesus to come and to follow him, to be his disciples. But here is the problem. In our culture, we want a discipleship that demands nothing from us. And then we have a tendency to complain when it changes nothing in us. Now, here's, here's what I mean by that. We have this desire to be changed, but we don't really devote ourselves to, way, to Jesus much of the time. He's more like an extracurricular, an add-on, where we practice what I call casual Christianity. But that's not really what we're invited to. But when we sort of practice this casual Christianity and inevitably changes nothing in us, we, we have a tendency to complain about that. But, you know, that's kind of like complaining about a gym that you have a membership at, but you never you never actually go and work out there, but you're like, man, this gym really doesn't work. It's changing nothing in my life. Well, that's not the gym's fault. You didn't go. And that's the same thing that happens when we complain about Jesus changing nothing in our lives. When we have these thoughts of like, you know, this Jesus guy, he, he promises transformation, but he just sort of delivers more of the same. And so my question would be, but are, are we living lives devoted to him? Devoted to what he wants to say to us in his word, devoted to a type of fellowship and relationship with one another that does center around our formation in the image of Christ? Are we devoted to gathering together week after week after week to worship Jesus and have that culminate in the celebration of communion together? Are we committed to prayer, devoted to these things in our lives? And so I want to just leave you with this simple phrase for you to think about, for you to pray about, for you to take to the Spirit and to ask Him, what, what, what does it look like for me to live life devoted to you? But what I'm quite certain of, not just because of this verse, but because of so many words of Jesus and so many other places in the New Testament, what I'm certain of is this, is that discipleship demands devotion from us. And so I can't promise you this is going to be your best year ever, but what I can promise you is that this can be your deepest year with Jesus to date if you are willing, by his grace, with his help, to devote yourself to him. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for these people. Thank you for everyone who will watch this, who will listen. And I just pray that you would give us clarity as to what it looks like to live life devoted to you in this new year. It's hard. It's not easy. It can be confusing for us. And so... Lord, just remind us even now that we don't do this on our own, that you are with us. You promise to never leave us and never forsake us. And we follow you by grace. We walk with you by grace. And we devote ourselves to you by grace. So would you give us the grace necessary to live out the devotion that discipleship demands from us? In Jesus' name, amen.